Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Hmm, interesting. Again, the number seven. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver thee, deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. All right? Don't make a covenant with these people, in other words. And you're going to see that that's part of the thing in the future, that the Jews are going to make a covenant. We'll get into that as we continue. They're going to disobey God again, in other words. Verse 3, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. I, get always in, I always get in trouble for that, you know. Oh, how dare you speak against interracial marriage? Well, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter and uh, thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. Let me make another point on this whole interracial marriage thing here. Um, and they, they'll say, well, see, it, you know, interracial marriages that were forbidden in the Old Testament, it was about them turning away the hearts of the children of Israel to go after other gods. That was, that's why God was against it. But, but look at the context here. Look at the, look at the verse 3 there. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. He doesn't say, don't make marriages with them um, unless they convert to Judaism and then, and then that's fine then you're okay because they aren't going to go after other gods. He doesn't say that. He just simply says, don't make marriages with them. These seven nations, you know, seven Gentile nations there. But continuing, verse 6, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Egypt, or from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, remember that for later, thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face, to destroy them, he will not be slack to him that hideth, or him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. But you gotta love that about the Lord. You know. The Lord is not gonna kinda, you know, just sneakily, you know, get somebody. He's gonna say, Stand before me at the great white throne judgment. These are the things you said about me. I don't know if he'll play a video or it'll just, you know, whatever else or you know, video. I mean, he could just play. I don't. I don't even know how it would work in heaven. But the whole point is, things that people speak against God, they're going to have to answer to His face. You know, and the Bible says about every mouth will be stopped. And God's going to mock in that day. Could it be the Lord's going to look and say, "What was that you said about me?" Sitting up there on His throne, you have an opportunity. You were going to say what to me if you, if you saw me? Glad I'm saved. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 9. Okay, now we're going to see one of the conditional clauses here of this covenant, the Mosaic covenant. Deuteronomy 29 verse 9. Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. They are to keep the covenant by doing what the Lord tells them to do. It's conditional then on their obedience to God's laws. 1 Samuel chapter 18. First Samuel chapter 18, verse 1 through 3. We're going to see another covenant here. 
Okay, it says here, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, and would let him go no more to home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. All right, they were very close, like brothers, in other words. All right, they made a covenant. Two best friends made a covenant. You say, well, just kind of a little nice agreement or whatever else. No, go over to 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 8. It says here, Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. So this covenant was more than just a, hey, we're best buddies, right? You know, or something. No, there was it was actually a, a holy thing between the two of them. Um Notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself, for why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? David speaking to Jonathan there. So, it's something that God recognized. He recognized that this covenant there between Jonathan and David was a holy thing. You know, you know, because Jonathan, of course, knew that, he, that David was going to be the king. And Jonathan was... You know, the prince is essentially underneath the king. So King Saul dies. Well, it's Jonathan's turn to become the king. But Jonathan is saying, hey, I know that you're God's man, David. And so let's make a covenant between me and you. You know, you spare my life because, you know, you're going to be king next. Not me. Not the prince, in other words. That's what it was about. And God had respect to that covenant that they made. Next, we're going to go to Second Chronicles chapter 6. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 12. And he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel, and spread forth his hands. For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long, and five cubits broad, and three cubits high. And had set in it in the midst of the court, and upon it he stood, and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel, and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven, nor in the earth, which keepest covenant, and showest mercy unto thy servants, that walk before thee with all their hearts. Okay? So, even from the mouth of Solomon, Solomon is saying, I know you're not going to break the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant there. <clears throat> Next go to Ezra. The book of Ezra. Um, Ezra chapter 10. Here we see another covenant that's made between the Jewish people and they're making it towards God. Ezra chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. What are they weeping about? They were giving their daughters and things to other nations and taking their daughters unto them. Interracial marriage is what they're weeping about. And Shechaniah the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken strange wives of the people of the land, yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. They broke the Mosaic Covenant, the things that, that God said there, hey, don't go and give your, you know, sons and things, and, you know, uh, or don't take their, the daughters to your sons, and don't give your daughters to their sons. Look what he says here in verse 3. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble, tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word and they swear. They made a covenant between them and the Lord. They were getting out of fellowship with the Lord. They were starting to break that Mosaic Covenant. And they said, stop. Okay, we need to make 
something happened here. Let's make a covenant that we're going to put away. We're going to have a national divorce of the interracial marriage that's happened here. It's really something. Let's look up a few other verses here. Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Verse 34 through 37. Okay. Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. New Testament says, God that cannot lie. In the book of Titus. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. All right. So we see there again that God is not going to break his covenant. Now we are seeing another covenant being made here, and that is a covenant with David. That, you know, his throne that they would always rule there. It's a member of his family that's going to rule and reign. That's why you have, you know, millennial kingdom references where it talks about, the, you know, the throne of David. You know, so that's what's going on there. It's the Davidic covenant, in other words. But let's continue. Psalm 105. But again, you know, as we're turning to Psalm 105, you see God saying, I'm not going to break my covenant. Psalm 105, verses 6 through 10. O ye seed of Abraham his servant, ye children of Jacob his chosen, he is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Remember I said about that earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. It talks about that, the word which he hath commanded to a thousand generations. Verse 9 which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. There you go. People, oh, well, you know, that covenant was cut off. Well, then you're calling God a liar. Just as simple as that. Anybody that teaches replacement theology is calling God a liar. And, you know, what are little word games they try to play? Well, it's not that it's the covenant was disannulled. It's just it's been moved from the physical seed to the spiritual seed. But the covenant was to physical seed, for physical land. There's no way to get around it. If you teach replacement theology, you're calling God a liar. Just that simple. <clears throat> Next go to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28, verse 14 through 18. It says here, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, here's where it gets very interesting, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and have under falsehood, have we hid ourselves? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Talking about Jesus Christ there in verse 16. It's a prophecy about him. <clears throat> verse 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. There's so many things I could say here with this you know, stuff. It's just amazing. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. Boy, I mean, just so many times. It's just incredible with what we've been reading. The Jews, you break the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, God's judgment and everything else comes upon you. The seven judgments, the seven, the seven, the seven. Very interesting. And when the Jews make a covenant with death and hell, hmm, 
What are the, what's the uh, fourth rider, the fourth horse rider in the book of Revelation, chapter 6? Death and hell follows him. I think you can call that kind of an interesting thing there. Go next to Daniel, chapter 9. I'll show you when this covenant comes in. If you don't already know, Daniel chapter 9. And I taught this thing. I, I, we were watching one of my sermons, you know, will the Jews worship a Gentile Pope? And, you know, I said about the, the peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs. There will be no peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs. It's never going to happen. Never. The covenant is going to be between the Vatican and the nation of Israel. And I believe that that covenant already is in the, the process of their kind of ironing it out and, and whatever. What are you going to get? Well, what are we going to get in return? And they're ironing the thing out. It's Zionism versus fascist Catholicism. That's what the thing is. Islam is a joke. Islam is not part of the end times thing, other than the fact that the Antichrist is going to go out making war, conquering and conquering, you know, uh, to conquer and conquering. Um, but, you know, Revelation chapter 6, verse 2 talks about that. And he goes forth conquering and to conquer. Got to get my wording right. And so there will be a war against Islam, a holy war, a crusade, in other words led by the Pope, the next Pope, which will be, I believe, the Antichrist, the man of sin. I could be wrong. They might throw in some other decrepit old man there just to kind of keep people thinking that the system is there and whatever else. But then they're going to pull in the real guy, the real Pope, the Antichrist, the man of sin, son of perdition. Um, and he's going to be confirming that covenant between the Vatican and the nation of Israel. And I think part of the, the carrot that's being dangled right now in front of the eyes of the you know, Zionist Jews, the ones that are very rich and powerful. Uh, and there are rich and powerful Jews, definitely. And I think that the carrot that's being dangled in front of their faces is, um, you give us authority in Jerusalem and we'll wipe out the Muslims. We'll stage a holy war, a crusade against Islam, and wipe them off the face of the earth. It'd be rather tempting for the Jews to, you know, can, you know sign that covenant. And I think that that's what's going on there in Isaiah 28. But let's look here. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. All right. Right there, this one verse, verse 24, totally debunks any kind of thing about the church going into the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, it just totally destroys that thing. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. What's the holy city of Christianity? There is no holy city. You know, they, they met a lot in Antioch, but that's certainly not given as a holy city. Uh, the Vatican is an unholy city. We'll give them that, you know. We don't have a holy city. So, you know, there's ascension which, you know, we're holy people. Certainly, you know, the Lord, it's His holiness that He gives to us. But we're not a chosen people or anything as far as the same. We don't have a, you know, a, you know, Christian covenant or something. You know, the Abrahamic covenant, they have that to the physical seed, you know. So it's talking about the Jews here. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Um finish the transgression and make an end of sins. We already have that through Jesus Christ. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. We already have it through Jesus Christ. We don't need that in the time of Jacob's trouble coming up in the future. And to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. We already had all that stuff happen. It's not for us, in other words. The 70th week, in other words, is not for Christians. Verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. All right. I think that that's going on right now. Very troublous times. You know, I don't know what's going to happen here in May this year with Donald Trump saying that he's, they're going to make the embassy thing happen, you know, on, you know, May 14th, 1948. I don't know. I think the world could change very drastically, very quickly um, with this Islamic type of a thing. I don't know. We could be going home 
very soon, in other words. Verse 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. You say, wait a second. I thought the Noahic, the Noahic covenant said the earth isn't going to be destroyed with a flood anymore. Well, it's not going to be. The earth isn't going to be destroyed. But certainly over there, you know, you can read about uh, Revelation chapter 12. Just go there real quick. Keep your hand in Daniel chapter 9. I mean, it just tie-ins and tie-ins and tie-ins doing this study. I'm going to be showing you another one that I don't even have in my notes. Like I said, we were talking about this morning. It's just crazy. But Revelation chapter 12. Um, uh, let's see here. Looking for the verse that talks about a flood. Um, okay, verse 15, Revelation 12, verse 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's going to be important later. We'll get back to that. <laughs> All right. But you see, that's the flood that's being referred to. Go back to Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 26. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. All right. And again, you know, people will take this thing and they'll go, they'll say, well, verse 26 is talking about Jesus. He's the Messiah there. And uh, so it's, it's talking about that. So, you know, there is no covenant that gets confirmed. Yeah, but it's talking about Jesus there, the Messiah, all right? But then it goes down to talking about, you know, um, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. That prince that shall come, it's talking about the Antichrist. Let me show you, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the covenant, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. They're right there. You know, it's not talking about Jesus. It's not talking about the Messiah. It's talking about the prince of the people that shall come, the Antichrist. All right? It switches there. All right? Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Colon. Then it goes into talking about the Antichrist. He's the one that confirms the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. So Jesus Christ is talking about in Matthew chapter 24. The, abom the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. It's referring back to this. Uh, continuing here, verse 27. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. All right, The abomination of desolation. He sets himself up in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about that. So, a lot of stuff going on here. A whole lot of stuff. But this is the covenant of with death and hell that the Jews make in the future. They're making it with their worst enemy. See? And, you know, it just, the, the tie-ins are just incredible. You know, we need to come together to, you know, for the common good or, to, you know, our, let's fight our common enemy. And so the Jews look and they're saying these, the Muslim world is growing and growing and growing and the Vatican is saying, yeah, we can't really take over things appropriately until this Islamic problem is taken care of. You know, and they've already been carrying out this crusade against Islam. They've already killed untold hundreds of thousands of, of you know, descendants of Ishmael, of Arabic people, Islamic in religion. Um, you know, they have the Rohingya uh, Muslims over there. Um, I can't think of, I cannot think of where that... Is it the Philippines, I think, or something? But they're they're going in there and ethnic cleansing, just slaughtering the people. Um, there's going to be a war against Islam. There already is a war against Islam. But it's going to get a lot worse. Uh, there's a Somebody wrote to me the thing about the Winslow Plan. Uh, if you really want to get creeped out, look up the Winslow Plan, I think it's called. Uh, W-I-N-S-L-O-W. Winslow, you know, in other words. If my, if my memory serves me correctly. And it's talking about how Islam could be wiped out very quickly. And this guy's a Catholic that's writing it. 
and he talks about the church and everything else and bringing in a new world order and whatever and that how we could easily wipe out Islam. And looking at the plan, I'm thinking, yeah, that would work. It really would work. I'm not saying I'm for it, but I'm saying it would work, what they have planned. Nuking Mecca and Medina while they're having their Ramadan or whatever the big thing is with Islam. Just nuke the thing. You'd wipe out you know, a huge number of Muslims, and uh, with their holy cities gone, uh, the rest would fall pretty quickly. So, but, uh, and of course you'd have the thing of them, the Muslims that would be left would go crazy for a while. And so you could throw in, you could kick in martial law, you could kick in all kinds of other stuff, uh, take people's rights away from them. And uh, you'd get a nice big slaughter all over the earth and things, and, and then you could restore law and order, and everybody would be anxious for law and order to be restored, thereby bringing in the Antichrist kingdom. I think if that's, what can, that's what's going to happen. Because, you know, what's the Antichrist come to bring? Comes to bring peace. How can he bring peace if there's peace already in the earth? No, he, can, he comes to bring peace uh, because the world is chaotic. We're leaving sometime in that area there. I don't know when. The uh, Lord has not revealed that to me yet. Um, but anyways, let's continue here. Um, go next to Jeremiah chapter 31. Um, so we see there, I had to skip ahead from Isaiah to Daniel, but then we got to go back to Jeremiah. Normally, when I'm doing a word study, normally it's, you're going to see it's kind of going by the books of the Bible, kind of chronological. But uh, I had to go to Daniel to show what the covenant with death and hell is all about. And it's going to be disannulled too. It's kind of funny because it only lasts about three and a half years. So Jeremiah chapter 31 Starting in verse 31, <clears throat> we're going to see about this thing of the new covenant. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Hmm. So God's not going to give them an opportunity to say, well, here's the laws, please follow them. It's up to you. This is supposed to be a perpetual covenant between me and you. You know, do these things that I'm telling you to do. Uh-uh. In the future, God's actually going to write it in their hearts. Very interesting. Remember that. Verse 34, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Hmm. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Hmm. This is a new covenant that's coming. Now, I remember, you know, Anderson, Stephen Anderson, the one time in his uh, marching to Zion moments or whatever else, and I debunked all those things. And he had this thing about, see, there's a new covenant. So the Abrahamic covenant is gone. You know, being the dirty snake that he is, he tried to say that the new covenant that comes in is a new form of the Abrahamic covenant. No, it's the Mosaic covenant. That's what the new covenant is all about. I'm going to prove that to you here. Romans chapter 11. And I might say a few more things about this, but let me just say, when the new versions try to say that uh, they replaced New Testament with New Covenant, um, they're trying to say that the New Covenant came in with Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That's a lie. The New Covenant doesn't come until the time of Jacob's trouble going into the Millennial Kingdom. That's when it comes in. So the New Testament, or excuse me, the New Versions say, not New Testament, this is a New Testament in my blood. They say, the New Covenant, that's very, very dangerous. I would say that's replacement theology. They're trying to teach that. Get it into the minds of the people. There's a New Covenant that already started in the first century with Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That brought in the New Covenant. No, it didn't. The New Covenant hasn't happened yet, but it's going to in the future. I'm going to give you a theory about that. And like I said, this is going to be a different, whole other study. 
because we really got into some deep stuff on it. But let's continue here. Romans chapter 11, this thing of God writing his laws in their heart and uh, the thing about they're not going to have to teach anybody because they're, gonna, they're all going to believe in the Lord and the Lord's going to take their sins away. Look at this, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, when God's done dealing with the Gentile nations. Verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. And you say, well, that just means, you know, when they get saved, they hear about Jesus and they believe by faith and everything else. Um, if you have God's laws written in your mind and in your heart, and you don't need to go out and say, you know, about knowing the Lord, whatever, because everybody's going to know him and God takes away their sins. That's not what we have today. It's a very interesting thing. Now go back to Ezekiel 34, back to the Old Testament. There's a very interesting tie-in coming up here. Ezekiel 34, verse 23 through 31. Okay, it says here, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. Remember the Davidic, the Davidic covenant? You know, the future millennial, the king of kings, is going to be sitting on the throne of David. He's actually called here David. He's going to be the shepherd over them. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Very interesting because it's the exact opposite of what he said back in Deuteronomy. If you do evil, if you break my Mosaic covenant, in other words, if you break that covenant, I'm going to send beasts after you. You're going to you're not going to have peace. You're going to be afraid all the time. And what have been the history of the Jews since they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, nationally rejected him? I'm not talking about individual Jews that got saved. What's been the history of the Jews? They've been hunted down like animals. Hmm. Verse 26, And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in the, his season. There shall be showers of blessing. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. That's an old hymn. It brings that to mind. Amazing, the old hymns, you know, based upon Scripture. It's really neat to study those. Verse 27, And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the, the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. Hmm. Verse 25, And I will make with them a covenant of peace will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. Huh. Well, obviously, this passage here is talking about the millennial kingdom. This couldn't be in the time of Jacob's trouble because the Lord has to shorten days so that some of them would be saved. All right? So it can't be talking about that. But this covenant of peace comes in after, I believe, after the new covenant. But when does the new covenant come in? Here's an interesting thing. Go back to Hebrews chapter 8. I'm going to give you a theory at the end of this because we're just, we're just started to kind of reveal some of this to us today in our conversation that we had. But I want 
you know, so far I'm dealing with the scriptures. This is the way it is, you know, whatever. But I'm going to give you my theory at the end, and I want you to let me know your thoughts out there, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 through 13. Here we have a referring back to what we were reading earlier in Jeremiah chapter 31, which is interesting because Jeremiah 31 comes after Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30 has the term, verse 7, has the term time of Jacob's trouble. Hmm. So you have the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30, Jeremiah chapter 31, the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. God gave them that Mosaic covenant, but it was conditional upon their obedience to the laws of Moses. They rejected those laws. God didn't regard them. So, oh, they're just going to get killed now. Okay, whatever. And you look at the history of the Jews. They've suffered tremendously. Why? They broke the covenant, the Mosaic covenant. But God never got rid of the Abrahamic covenant, and God is going to bring in a new Mosaic covenant. Verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Compare that to Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now, I'm going to give you my theory. All right, that is the end of my notes. And we were talking about this thing, my wife and I. And I, you know, the, the Lord has this this thing. Uh, the, this <laughs> I get study notes done. You know, this took me. You know, a couple days to go through all the references and things. I'm going through all this. I'm looking at some of Ruckman's stuff and I'm going, okay, well, you know, I got this whole thing done. I knew that he had said some stuff about, you know, the covenants in here versus Testament. And I thought, all right, well, I'm going to do my study first and then I'm going to go and I'm going to see if his work confirms what the Lord showed me here. Yeah, lines up and things. So you get the whole thing done. I'm all excited. Okay, I got to preach this sermon today. And we get to talking about it, and the scriptures just start to be wrought to my mind and to my wife's mind, and we're talking about it, getting all excited and saying, what if this means that? What if that goes over here? Whatever, whatever. And and I said to my wife, I said, why do you have to do this? You know, <laughs> she said, what, what? I said, I, I, I got the notes done. I, you know, I, this is a whole other subject. I can't, I can't put this in at the end of the thing and whatever else. And, uh, you know, I was giving her a hard time and stuff. We, you know, I thank the Lord for my wife. But uh, here's the theory, okay? What was the first Mosaic Covenant? Well, we saw the words of the Ten Commandments, the law there. Not just the Ten Commandments. I think it would also be include a lot of the Mosaic laws there. Um, that one is decaying and waxing old. A lot of the Jews, you know, the Jews of today, I mean, they're not even, you know, ultra-Orthodox or Orthodox or the Reformed or, you know, any of the, the groups of the Jews out there, none of them are following the Old Testament, all right? They're not. You know, they can't. But here's the interesting thing. What if the Lord doesn't wait until the Millennial Kingdom to make this new covenant happen? What if it happens in the time of Jacob's trouble? And what if Moses is the one that introduces it? Why? Two witnesses. 
Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> I've gone over this thing different times. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And you go, okay, what are the commandments of God? Well, it couldn't be keeping the commandments of God in the sense of Old Testament commandments because nobody could keep those. But what if God writes it into their hearts and into their minds? You say, well, I don't understand. Think about something. Revelation chapter 7. You know, well, go back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth, wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Remnant. Not all of them, just a remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Again, we see the thing of keeping the commandments of God. And you say, but that's not possible. You can't keep the commandments of God. You can't keep the commandments of God under the old covenant. But in the new covenant, they will be able to. Hmm. I'll show you my theory here. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the, and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Well, you know, you think to yourself, okay, it's going to be some kind of a seal or Hebrew letter or something that gets sealed in their forehead. Or it could be the new covenant. Hmm. What if that seal that seals these 144,000 Jews, what if it is the new covenant that's brought in by Moses and preached by Moses? Hmm. Just theory right now, okay? I'm just I'm not saying I'm not going to teach this thing as doctrine. I'm just simply saying it just because you you know you look and you're thinking, how on earth could people keep the commandments in this time of Jacob's trouble? You know, and you say, well, things are going to be a lot more apparent then. There's not going to be the you know, the Bible's going to definitely be true. There's not going to be anybody saying, well, you know, I mean there, there's an element of faith there, yes, in the time of Jacob's trouble, but a lot of it's going to be by sight. You're going to have total confirmation that the Bible is true. Um, but how could you keep the commandments? <laughs> you know, unless the new covenant is starting to come in. Moses brings it in, 144,000 confirm it, and then you go into the millennial kingdom when those people are taken in there, the sheep on the right hand, when they go in, then that's when they dwell safely. God establishes his new covenant with them. I mean, think about it. How was the old, old Covenant established? Just one day, God said, new, you know, old, here's, here's your Mosaic Covenant. Boom, there you go. Mm -mm. It starts with them being brought out of Egypt. He took them by the hand and said, come on, let's go out of Egypt. Huh. Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt in the time of Jacob's trouble. And the Jews have to flee. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. They have to get out of there. I don't know. And you get these new versions coming along and they say, this is the blood of the new covenant. Trying to eliminate the fact that the new covenant is going to come in in the time of Jacob's trouble. And saying, oh, it came in with Jesus Christ. See, he brought in the new covenant and those that accept him and, you know, are Christians, now they have the new covenant and therefore they are now spiritually Abraham's seed, therefore they get that covenant too. They steal both covenants from the Jewish people. We don't get the new covenant as Christians. The new covenant is there for the Jews. And I believe it's going to be for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why they're able to keep the commandments of God. Because it's written in their heart, written in their mind. And that could be the seal of that's sealed in their forehead. What do you think? I'd like to have your input on that. So, there's a bunch more scriptures, you know, the Lord was kind of putting in my head and, <clears throat> and things, but, you know, this is what I'm going to open up to the body of Christ. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, hopefully you've learned some things from this study. I know I have. Uh, a lot of this stuff I was kind of sketchy on and I kind of thought, well, I kind of understand the different covenants. And I, I'm somewhat familiar, but I never actually did the study before. 
and uh, it was a big study. You know, this thing is hour and 49 minutes so far here. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit less than that because there's, you know, started up and things and get things ready to go. But, you know, it's been a long study, but uh, pretty interesting. So uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this challenge from your word. I know it was a, a great um, joy to me to be able to go through your word and spend some real time in your word with you, Lord. And I pray that those listening to this study would, would also take time on their own to, to really search the scriptures and uh, compare scriptures and, and just be open to your leading, Lord, and, and uh, to judge themselves. We, as we read about earlier, the, the New Testament there, Lord, is that was brought in by you, by your death on the cross. I pray, Lord, that we would all examine ourselves and, and get rid of sin out of our lives because it's negative. It, it's, uh, it'll hurt you. And I pray, Lord, that you would convict all those out there that are listening to this of any sins that they have in their life. And um, help us, Lord. We're weak. Or we're very frail. And I just pray, Lord, that you would please keep all of us in your word and uh, show us these things Lord, I know that it's not all for us. I know that the time of Jacob's trouble is not for uh, our understanding right now in this time. Um, but uh, I just pray, Lord, that we would be able to leave when you call us out of here at the catching away. Lord, I pray that we would be able to leave some information out there uh, that will help those people and that go into the time of Jacob's trouble. And um, I pray, Lord, for any Jew out there. Uh, <clears throat> I pray that that uh, they would be convicted and uh, realize that the old covenant is not is not going to get them to heaven, and that that new covenant that they're waiting for they can they can beat that um, by coming to you and accepting the new testament in your blood and uh, getting out before the new covenant comes in. And I just uh, pray, Lord, that you would help us to be good witnesses for thee. Help us not to fall for the wiles of the devil and for his ministers which seek to turn us from your word. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. That's going to be it. So, um, also had a brother, uh, brother Chad, um, and he, he, we had a conversation back and forth and he said about the thing of, um, you know, that I'm not a pastor. And I agree with that. Uh, and, and, you know, I need to kind of explain that. And that is, you know, I get into these things with people where I have to kind of try to do this church discipline thing. And it's just not possible. I mean, I, I can try, but, I, you know, I'm dealing with people from all over the world here on Patreon. And uh, those of you that are faithful viewers and things and faithful supporters of this ministry, you know, how can I be there in your life? How can I see things and whatever else? And and I do my best, you know, and I'm open to criticism. I really am. Uh Again, going back to the thing that happened with that Don Garrison guy that said, you know, Wolf Among the Sheep or whatever, that video. Um, he was doing things, and it, I mean, let me just clarify something. If I would have, when I confronted him, if he would have come and said, hey, I said a few things here, and I do disagree with you on a number of points. These are the points, but overall, you're, you're a good preacher. I, I support your ministry, whatever. That would have been the end of the story for me. I would not have banned him. I wouldn't have blocked him. But the fact that he would not, when confronted, he would not say, hey, you know, he doesn't have to tell me everything that went on between him and Kyle Falsberg. But just, you know, I asked a legitimate question. I'm seeing something that's sneaking around behind my back. Um, I don't appreciate that. Uh, if you have problems or issues with me, uh, take them to the Lord first off. And if they're really big, come to me. You know, don't talk behind my back. But I can't be there to pastor a, a congregation that I'm not even seeing in the flesh before me. Um, so what is my role? Well, my role is to teach and preach the Word of God. King James Video Ministries exists to do what I did today. Um, you know, a lot of my studies I feel, I, you know, I feel a, a rushing kind of a thing because I'm trying to get out as much information as I can. Um, I really, I really want to kind of get away from that. I want to really do more thorough studies that are going to take me a little bit more time um, to prepare and more time to preach. Uh, 
the Lord's given me a gift for teaching His Word, not for pastoring a small local congregation or something like that. That's not my, my gift from the Lord. That's not why the Lord wants me in ministry. So uh, Brother Chad said, you know, maybe you could do a, a, uh, um, a video on the difference between Paul's ministry and Timothy. And, I, you know, that's another one I'm going to be working on, uh, just kind of going over um, the thing of a Bible teacher, preacher versus a pastor. Um, and, you know, I'm still trying to work all this stuff out. I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm not infallible. Uh, I do my best. That's all I can say. <laughs> I do my best. And, uh, you know, I get attacked an awful lot, and um, yeah, I kind of get used to it over the years and things. But it's still... You know, I, when I get attacked, I don't, it's not that my feelings are hurt. Um, it's more, it's, I, I take that time to, to say, to question myself and say, okay, these things that these people are saying about you, are they true? I, I take that criticism and, you know, I, I get upset sometimes because some of the attacks are just so, so vile and just so horrible. But I, really the whole thing is I, I constantly am examining myself and saying, you know, I want to I be able to teach and preach the Word of God correctly. And I'm not, I do care about people. Um, I do care about your opinions. I, that's why the, the main reason Patreon happened here um, is not some money-making scam or whatever else. I need to clarify that again. Um, the main reason for Patreon is interaction with people that are serious about this ministry. I have a little bit better control here than I do over at YouTube um, as far as comments and, and people stealing my videos and whatever and cutting them up and making me look ridiculous and whatever. Uh, so, but please, if, you, if, if any of you out there ever have any issues with me or whatever else, write to me and, and talk to me about it. I'm not going to agree with everybody 100% of the time. You don't have to agree with me 100% of the time, but, uh, you know, if you're here, you're learning, you've learned from me in the past, well, then pray for me, you know. So, I um, guess that's going to be it. Like I said, there's a bunch more things I have planned for the future. Uh, some big studies coming up that I need to do. So, it's not going to be a whole lot of videos. I'm, I do want to keep, you know, the momentum going, so to speak, as far as short videos coming out with, you know, attacking the ESV or any kind of other little things like that. But bigger studies, I want to have more detail in my studies. Um, so, and, and another thing, uh, Brother Philip Newton brought this up, and that is, he said, why not post newer videos, that any video that you're putting, unless it's a gospel presentation, but any videos that you put on YouTube, post them here on Patreon as well. That's why I put up the ESV videos, because that way you can comment on the videos and right back and forth with each other and discuss these differences and things with ESV versus, you know, King James Bible. So I'm also going to try to do that um, because there's no, you know, you're not having to pay for each video. It's a monthly fee. So um, I'm going to, videos that I'm going to be bringing out, I'm going to post them here first, release them here first, and then over on YouTube. So it's just, you know, I'm still trying to work out the bugs of this whole system of this Patreon thing. So I do appreciate comments. I do appreciate um, the input that I have so uh, from the brethren so that is going to be it oh another announcement here um, brother uh, Jeremy Carter the uh, eternal redemption is his channel and there's a I think brother Tim I think um, AVBTM or something Bible Thumper Ministries authorized version Bible Thumper Ministries I think is what it is they have a little uh, uh, like a talk thing or whatever on Saturday night, and um, I'm going to be over like a live stream type of a thing, um, and I'm going to be doing that. That's going to be my first time doing a live stream type of uh, broadcast or whatever else. So I'm going to be over there on Saturday night, and uh, so you can check that out if you want to. And again, I'm you know going to be experimenting with that possibly in the future. So do appreciate your prayers out there. Um, let me know out, you know, what you think of the the thing of the possibility of the new covenant coming in, the time of Jacob's trouble, Moses being the one that brings it in. Uh, I really think that it'd be kind of an interesting thing if Moses is there, Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, Revelation chapter 11, they're preaching the book of Hebrews in the streets of Jerusalem. 
I think it'd be pretty interesting. So let me know what you think. Uh, thank you to all of you for your support of this ministry and your friendship. And that's going to be it. We will see you in the next video.